So I think Stay Woke is probably a pretty appropriate sermon title today, given our, our lack of sleep last night. Hopefully we're staying awake, so maybe we got a little coffee, a little caffeine in us. Hopefully the Holy Spirit's at work to uh, invigorate us a little bit today. Um, but I want to share this, this poster that uh, our family made at the beginning of the new year. Michelle kind of prompted us as a family to uh, have our New Year's resolution to set out some goals for the year. And to be completely honest, I don't think I was there when we actually started doing this. And I, ne- I never actually wrote anything down on the poster board. But I, um, I decided this week I better catch up with the rest of the family. So it's better to be late than never, I guess, right? And so we have some of our, our goals for the year, kind of our New Year's resolution, the things that we want to be committed to uh, this year. And um, some of our goals are pretty, genfo- gen- pretty general, like be joyful, you know, Read the Bible and live it. Be more kind and more patient with others. You know, goods, important things to do, but just kind of general things, things that are kind of hard to, hard to measure. Um, some of our goals are more specific, such as start on the varsity, read at least one book each month, and stay out of jail. <laughs> so hopefully we'll be able to attain those goals. Uh, some of the goals are pretty attainable, like raise my GPA, And some of the goals are probably less likely to happen, like make Jurassic Park. That's pretty ambitious, I'd say. Some advanced degrees in biology, among other things, they even hope to do that. And as Michelle mentioned in prayer time, um, Lynn took a big step towards her goals. You see hers are on the big, big red letters on on the right side of the image. Grind hard, go to college, raise my GPA, place college, soccer. Well, uh... Last Friday, we made this trip to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and uh, Lynn signed her letter of intent to go to school and to play soccer at uh, Regent University. And so, um, major, major step towards that goal. That's just an, an awesome thing. We praise God for that. And I think it was probably also Lynn's prompting to kind of summarize the entire board here, all of our goals and ambitions and, and hopes for the year, with this phrase, stay woke, okay? And, you know, I'm not real up on the terms that the the kids use, the the, the slang that's used these days. But I think I got a pretty good grasp of what stay woke means. I I think it pretty much means, you know, um, stay committed to the cause, right? Don't forget about what's important. Be tenacious in working towards your goals. Never lose sight of what you're striving for. That that is to to stay woke, right? Isn't that kind of it, I hope? Well... In today's text, Jesus literally tells the disciples to stay woke. In his case, he's not concerned about us achieving our personal goals so much as he wants them to be alert to the spiritual dangers that are around them. And he wants them to, be, to, uh, to stay focused on doing the will of God. Stay woke. And he says in verse 40, he tells his disciples, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. So it's, a, it's a good thing for us to have these goals that we strive for. Raise your GPA, make the varsity, you know, read your books, do all those things. Those are good things to, to do, and, and we should strive for those. But it's far more important for us to stay woke in doing the will of God in our lives. And whatever our personal goals might be, we must first strive to do the will of God. And, the, and doing the will of God can be in the context of those things, certainly trying to raise your GPA and go to school and achieve athletic accomplishments, all those things can be done in the context of, of seeking to do God's will in our lives. But what is priority over everything else, no matter what we're, we're striving for in our personal goals, is to seek to please God with who we are and, and, and to do God's will. And so we need to recognize that there are powerful forces in this world that are trying to get in our way from, from doing God's will, from pursuing God's will and accomplishing it. There's, there's ourself, first of all, our own, our own sinful inclinations. We want to live selfishly for us rather than, than live for God. And, and whether others are conscious of it or not, they may or may not be, depending on the circumstances, a lot of times other people are trying to get in our way from doing the will of God and, 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 and following his, his plan for us. And, and more than that, the, the evil one is, is actually trying to keep us from God's will. There's, there's darkness in this world that's trying to keep us from living in the light. And we're going to face trials, and we're going to face temptations in this world, and so we need to be spiritually prepared for them um, as we seek to, to honor God with who we are. 
And so Jesus tells the disciples to pray. He says, pray that you may not come into the time of trial. And then, so Jesus tells them to pray. You go pray, um, seek God's strength, seek God's wisdom, get ready for the trials you're going to face. And then Jesus, being the perfect human being, offers the perfect example for them. And he kind of goes off a little bit on his own. And then he goes and he starts to, to pray as well. And Jesus gives us an example of that we're called to stay woke in prayer, right? And so Jesus goes off to pray. And, and notice how he prays. In verse 42, he says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. And that seems like kind of an odd prayer. What does that even mean, remove this cup from me? Well, in the Old Testament, specifically in, in Psalm 75, and I think there's a text in Isaiah as well, um, and also, if you look forward in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, uh, a cup is often used as a metaphor to depict the wrath of God. And so Jesus is saying, God, God, remove this cup from me. I don't want to suffer from your wrath. I mean, he's a human being. He knows how excruciating, literally excruciating, it's going to be for him to die on the cross. He knows it's coming, and he doesn't want to endure that. He doesn't want to have to have the, the, the wrath of God the, due to the sins of the entire world poured upon himself. He doesn't want to be beaten and flawed and have the crown of thorns pressed on his skull and be crucified. He doesn't want to experience the separation from the Father because of human sin. And so he, he wants a way out, and you, you can't blame him for that. But then quickly he turns it around. He, he, he confesses his human frailty. And then he turns it around and he says, yet, yet not my will, but your will be done. And so Jesus is praying for the strength and the wisdom and the wherewithal he needs to follow through in this impossible task of dying on the cross for the sins of the world. Not your will, God, or not my will, God, but your will uh, be done, he says. This is a, a model that Jesus gives us for how we're called to to pray in our lives, how we're called to seek God's strength and God's wisdom so that God might use us to, to do his will. We're, we're called to seek um, strength so that we can be faithful, so we can be obedient to seek God's glory in our lives. And especially when we face a time of trial, when we face something that's hard or painful or difficult, that's the time we're most likely to flee. It's easy for us to pray when things are going well, we just want to thank God for all that you've done for me. But when we really are struggling, when we're really in pain, when we really face a temptation or a trial, that's when we need, more than ever, to stay woke and to go to God in prayer. Now notice what happened when Jesus asked for um, the Father to, to help him do his will. Then in verse 43 it says, Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. And so God's, God answered his prayer right away, and he sends in this angel to, to give him the strength that he needs to continue forward in this in the struggle that he's going through. And I'm not going to promise you that if you pray, God, give me strength. God, help me. God, God, not my will, but your will be done. I, I can't promise you that if we do that, the angel Gabriel is going to come down in this magnificent light and just be this incredible presence uh, for you in your time of need. But I am extremely confident that when we ask God for help to do his will, he's not going to ignore us. And whether through it's the work of, through it's the, whether it's through the working of the Holy Spirit, or God sends an angel that we may not be even aware of, whatever the case may be, God is going to He wants us to do His will, right? So He's going to give us what we need to accomplish it. He's going to give us what we need uh, to pursue it. And so we follow Jesus' pattern. We follow His, his example, and we just go to God and say, "I don't want to do this. I can't do this. I need Your strength. I need Your help." Uh, but let it not be my will is done. Let your will be done in, in my life for your glory. And then we, so we see Jesus offers this prayer, and then God responds by giving him this help. And we think that that might be it, that the trial might be over. You know, he's got what he needs. But instead, it gets worse. In verse 44, it says, In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. That's, that's gross. I mean... There's blood coming from his face as he prays. And you know, what is going on here? That's actually a medical condition that, um, that sometimes happens when people face a lot of stress. It's called hematidrosis. And when, when people are under a lot of stress, they can actually um, respond with such angst that 
uh, blood vessels in there can break, and blood mixes with the sweat. And apparently that's what's happening with Jesus. He's praying with such intensity and with such fervor that um, he's actually bleeding in his sweat as he, as he prays to God. Now, that reminded me of this text in, in Hebrews 12. It says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And I think what the, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is, remember the intensity with which Jesus prayed to do God's will. And yeah, you want to do God's will. You've been praying. You've been trying, trying to do it. But you've not been trying that hard. You haven't been that intense in your efforts to pray. You, you, haven't, you haven't prayed like Jesus did, where um, you pray with such intensity and such fervor and such angst that you're actually breaking your capillaries. You don't, your blood and your sweat's not dripping all over the place. And, and really, I think what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, yeah, we've tried to do God's will, but you haven't given it everything you have. And that's, that's my, you may be thinking, well, that sounds extreme to me, and it is extreme. God calls us to put, an, put forth an extreme effort to obey him, to do his will. And you go back to our post here, stay woke. So we got people up here that, that want to play on the varsity. And we all know that if you want to uh, achieve athletic accomplishments, you've got to work at it. You got to run those sprints. You got to lift weights. You got to do the drills. You got to play the games. You got to put in your blood, sweat, and tears to reach your reach your goals. Right. The same is true academically. You want to achieve academic success. You want to reach your potential. You got to burn the midnight oil. You got to stay up late. You got to read the books. You got to do the homework. You got to stay on top of your work. You got to put forth your very best effort. Now, why should we expect it to be any different for us in our spiritual endeavors? Why should we think that, that, you know, a modest effort is sufficient in God's eyes? What's more important, to make the varsity or to live in the will of God? Right? Now, they can, you can do both, hopefully. You can play on the varsity while you're living in the will of God. I'm not saying they're opposed to each other. I'm saying if you put in that kind of intense effort towards your academic and your athletic pursuits, why would we not be expected by God to put in that kind of effort and intensity towards seeking to do God's will and honor him in our lives. We face temptation. Oh, I'm tempted, I submit. I, I, I follow my temptation. I follow my humanly fleshly desires. God says, no. Pray with fervor. Pray with angst. Pray with all that you have. Stay woke. Give all your effort and strength towards resisting that sin and living in, in the will of the Father. Now, we we see here that the disciples were unable to do this. Jesus said, go and pray. He leaves them. He goes to pray. He's bleeding, sweat, drops of blood, praying with angst, you know, giving everything he has to honor God. And then he comes back and checks on the disciples, and they're asleep. He's like, why are you asleep? Why are you taking your rest? What's going on here? Well, the text tells us that they fell asleep because of their grief. And we don't know exactly what they're grieving about. There's a number of things that we were just told, just leading up to this text, Maybe they're grieving because they realize that one of them is going to betray him. Maybe they're grieving because they feel, they feel bad about arguing over who, which one of them is going to be the greatest. Uh, maybe, maybe they're grieving um, because Jesus had just told Peter that he's going to deny him three times. Or maybe they're, maybe they're grieving because they, they realize something bad is going to happen to Jesus. You know, back in chapter 16, Jesus told them plainly, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the Gentiles, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be beaten, crucified, and he's going to rise from the dead. And for some reason, they, you know, that's just an incredible event, so they, they couldn't grasp it. They couldn't get their minds around it. But it seems to me now that they had the Last Supper together. And, and again, Jesus kind of reiterated what's going to happen. And he said, this is my body when he broke the bread. And this is my blood when he poured out the cup. And now they're out, and he, he told them, Peter's going to deny me. Someone's, Judas is going to betray me. Now they're out in the garden. They know that something's about to fall down here. Something, something bad is about to happen. And they're, they're anxious. And instead of finding strength and, and, and peace in God's presence by going to him in prayer, they feel overwhelmed by the whole thing. All these emotions are, are stirring and swirling inside of them. And they, they just they fall asleep. And so Jesus says, stay woke. Be devoted in prayer. And we see the difference in the response to the trial that comes 
between Jesus who stay woke, who stay woke and the disciples who could not. So Judas comes, right? And he comes to betray Jesus. And then we see a whole crowd of people are there. Chief priests, elders, members of the temple guard, servants. A whole crowd of people arrive suddenly and they're there to arrest Jesus. Now notice the contrast in how the disciples respond to this with how Jesus responds. Our natural human inclination when we face danger is to do one of two things, right? Either fight or flight. You've heard that before? Well, the disciples do both here. First of all, they want to fight. One of them says, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And notice they don't even bother to listen to him. They don't, they don't wait for an answer. They just pull out the sword and they start fighting. And the text doesn't tell us who does this, but we see in, in John, as Peter attacks a slave named Malchus, chops off his ear. That doesn't do a bit of good. Because this is all part of God's plan. God wants Jesus to uh, be arrested. And so the fighting doesn't help a bit. And then the other response we often, our natural response when we face danger is flight, is to run away. Well, the disciples do that too. They start to fight, that's fruitless. And then Luke doesn't tell us. We look at Matthew, we look at John, and the disciples scatter. They, they hightail it out of there. And so why did they react that way? They didn't stay woke. They weren't awake, alert to the dangers they're about to face. They didn't, weren't disciplined in seeking God's strength and his wisdom in prayer. Jesus, on the other hand, he's the perfect human being. He's God the Son, so he does everything according to the will of the Father. And so he was able to stay alert in prayer. He was able to depend upon God's strength and God's wisdom when he faced this trial. And look how Jesus responds to the situation. Judas comes at him, and... You know, you might expect Jesus, as he was, an, if he was a normal, ordinary human being, to either run away or to fight or to insult Judas for doing such a horrible thing as betraying him. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't cower at the danger that he's facing, but he also speaks with authority. And he tells Judas, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? He just confronts the evil that Judas is participating in. And then, uh, you know, he could be angry, he could be fighting these people that are attacking him and wanting to arrest him, but instead he shows compassion. This poor slave got his ear cut off, and what does Jesus do? Jesus is about to be arrested, he's about to be tortured. But Jesus has time for this man, he goes over and shows compassion, and he heals his wound. And Jesus is, um, you know, could have gone into a, a shouting match with the, with the religious leaders, he could have tried to fight them, he could have ran away. But instead, he simply states what they're doing. He confronts them in their sin and their wickedness. He, he says to them, you know what? For three years, I was in the temple teaching. All this time, you could have arrested me. But instead, here you are sneaking, sneaking in here in the middle of the night where no one's going to see it. You treat me like a bandit. You treat me like a thief, bringing clubs and swords. But this is your hour. You are part of the power of darkness. You're the ones living in evil. And so let it be, let it be so. And so Jesus allows himself to be arrested. And a response to that could be, yeah, well, look what it got him. He got himself crucified. How well did that work for him? Well, if that's the way we see things, then we're not seeing the big picture because Jesus knows that this is integral to God's plan, that he's come into this world for this purpose, to be a suffering servant, to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins to be the recipient of God's wrath poured out onto him that, that should be given to us because of our sinfulness. But uh, he chooses to, um, to receive it for us. And we see Jesus literally goes through hell, being separated from God, tormented by our sins and the consequences of them in order to offer us heaven. And so he trusted God's plan. He did God's will. And as we see what Jesus has done for us, uh, the lesson that we should learn and the response that we're going to have is to stay woke. We're to stay alert to the spiritual dangers around us. We're to be diligent in prayer. We're, asked, we're to ask God to give us strength to do his will. And doing that can be the difference between us being faithful to God in a time of trial or failing to be faithful in that time of trial. Now, the disciples, they, they failed, right? They didn't, they, weren't, they didn't stay woke. They ran off. They weren't obedient to God's will. It's important for us to recognize, though, that Jesus brought them back, didn't he? 
He, he, he affirmed them. He forgave them. He put them back into positions of, of leadership. He, he showed them grace. And so in the times that we fail, and there's going to be, there has been, and there will be more others, we can find comfort and encouragement in knowing that God's grace is enough for us, and he will restore us. And so we shouldn't get too discouraged if we're not always as committed to God's will as we should be. You know, you know, you know there's an old saying, you know, practice what you preach, right? The preacher should practice what he preaches. And last night I was uh, finishing up my sermon in my office, and as I usually do, I usually come in here and I practice a couple times and I pray. And, but it was, it was spring forward last night. I was going to lose an hour of sleep. Last night is my least favorite day of the year, every year. I hate losing that hour of sleep. And I, the minute I finished writing this sermon, I thought to myself, you know what, I am so tired, I'm not going to go pray in the sanctuary tonight. I'm not going to practice my sermon, I'm just going to go home and sleep. And then I realized, stay woke, Ryan. I need to go, pr- I need to go pray. I need to practice. I need to prepare. And not, not submit to the weakness of the flesh. And so we're constantly facing uh, those struggles. And the disciples, they learn their lesson. And we look in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, they are praying when the Holy Spirit comes down upon them. We see Peter is on the, the roof of the house praying in chapter 10 when he gets this vision to minister to the Gentiles. Paul is praying when the scales fall off his eyes and he comes to faith in Christ. Paul is praying again in the, in the, the jail in, in Philippi when uh, the door swing, earthquake comes and the, and the door is open and, and he's set free. And we see time and time again the disciples and the apostles have learned to pray to find God's strength and God's, God's will um, to serve God's kingdom in incredible ways. Now, today we have an advantage that the disciples did not have in the garden. We have the knowledge of the resurrection, and we have the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when we face trials and temptations, we can stay woke. We can be alert to the dangers around us. We can be diligent in prayer. And we can ask God to give us the wisdom and the strength we need to do his will for his glory. Thanks be to God. Amen.